I consult with uh, international organizations in the field of intellectual property, electronic commerce, technology, and uh, now the African continent of free trade area, which is an in thing in Africa. And I'm also a co-founder of the International Lawyers and Economists for Development, or ELI.org, where we advise, we provide technical assistance, policy assistance and advice and a lot of training and teaching and just to try and help people develop and especially those from developing countries. So we focus a lot on Africa and developing countries. And I'm so happy to bring a little of what I've learned in, in my travels and in my positioning in Geneva and other parts of the world and bring it back home, home here, yeah, I mean Africa. Thank you. Thank you so much, Susan, for that great opening. We're so happy to have you today. Today, we're going to be talking about intellectual property. We're going to be talking about small businesses. We're going to be talking about women as well, all in the context of intellectual property. Susan, could you please give us an overview of intellectual property? What do we need to know? First of intellectual property, yeah, we need to know what it is in the first place. A common definition or a traditional definition that is a creation of the mind, something that comes from the mind, so our thinking, our creativity, our innovation. But first, we, at least we have to think, oh, think about it in the mind and then uh, maybe express it depending on the intellectual property. So talking of expressing, there are different types of, of intellectual property. One of them are patents. They protect inventions, what we create in the mind, but express it as an invention. We talk of inventions mainly in uh, the pharmaceutical area. That's so obvious, but it could be any industry. It could be yeah, even in agriculture field, we have a lot of inventions in Africa. So that's one. The other one is uh, copyrights. This is uh, like, it protects our creativity, our uh, things like songs, things like what we write, drawings, and relating to this subject, things like uh, even how you design, design our mats, our baskets, there could be some copyrights there, but it really depends on how you, you, you design, you call it and how you brand it. The other area could be trade secrets of intellectual property is trade secrets. This, as it sounds, is what is the secret that is important for the trade? The WHO, the World Trade Organization, has an agreement on trade-related intellectual property rights. It refers to these trade secrets as any disclosed information. And all this terminology brings out what it is. It's not disclosed. It's information that is necessary for trade and it is kept secret. One example I can give off, which is well known, is the secret in the Coca-Cola. What it makes it taste that way, the way others drinks, similar drinks don't. But we can also think of trade secrets on, in Africa. What makes um, queen cakes, for example, from a bakery taste different and better from others? Or oh, it's a secret of the producer of the baker so that's one one possibility the other one is uh, industrial designs again this it just protects the aesthetic appearance of the object a beautiful chair for example a beautiful uh, even it could be pottery but the way in the field of pottery how it's designed how, how it's formed how it how it attracts the appearance you can look oh, wow that looks beautiful oh that looks unique that thing that attracts that looks unique makes the thing looks unique that makes the appearance look good that's what the intellectual property will protect of course they are there are standards there are checklists of whether it qualifies for protection the other area are uh, geographic indications i have to We've mentioned this because it's very, very important for Africa. It's another field of intellectual property. This identifies an object 
with the a geographical area so that the special uh, soil, the special climate in that area makes the product very unique. An example is Arabica coffee from the Mount Elgon slopes. It's unique. It's very unique. Maybe we learned that in school just to say, oh, Arabica coffee is different from Robusta. It has that, but, but actually what gives us that special qualities is the special climate. So we can say in terms of geographical indications, the Arabica coffee from the slopes of Mountain Elgon is different, is special. It can be identified. Others include the white pepper from Penja in West Africa and, and many other objects. Uh, I think those are the, there are other types of uh, intellectual property, but that's, I think, oh, there's traditional knowledge. How could I forget? That's for Africa. It's traditional knowledge. It's not yet protected on international level. There is no law. There is no framework for it. There are ongoing negotiations for that. But on African continent, we have a lot of traditional objects. Not long ago, I was blogging about the back cloth. I think many of us identify with it. Maybe nice handbags, nice little passes or Amongst some cultures, like the Baganda culture in Uganda, the back cloth is even worn as a dress for women. It's a very special, respected unique. But the process of making that cloth, it has come down from generation to generation. So it's had, there's a traditional knowledge in there. There are different aspects of traditional knowledge, but that's just an example. You spoke about recipes, for example, with baking. And it's making me wonder how easy or how feasible it is for us to patent our knowledge or protect our intellectual property in Africa. Because you find that a lot of times we create things to survive. Mm -hmm. And the way that our economies are, you know, you do something so that you can survive. You see somebody else yeah. doing it. You do the exact same thing. Mm -hmm. You know, the Veronica bucket that we were talking about in Ghana, there's a lady called Veronica. Um, she actually created this bucket to help mm -hmm. reduce the spread of diseases like COVID-19, cholera, and, you know, other ailments. Hmm. And earlier this year, she was really lamenting and just so sad that she has not patented it. And now it's too late because it's a bucket. Yeah. It's been created. There's a need. So 10, 20, 30 other people go and do the same. I mean, how does this, I know we're going to get into Africa, but how, how does intellectual property work? Especially you, when you mention things like traditional knowledge, how can you really protect what you create. Thank you for bringing back this Veronica Bucket situation again. It represents so many cases on the African continent. It also elsewhere, but it's so common on the African continent that people don't know the value of what they have. So there's a lack of information. The other example we have, Christine Sadler, is the m -Pesa. It's not protected by the person. It's not owned by the person who invented it because he didn't know there was value in that. And that's one of the things I would really I want to stress today that all the things we create or we touch, there can be value. We just need to ex explore it and find out what that value is and how to express it. So in the Veronica situation or bucket situation, there was a lack of knowledge of the invention, what, what could be patented. When it has to solve, uh, as, to be a solution to a problem, it has to have industry utility, which Veronica's bucket in that situation could be argued that yes, there was a utility, there was this COVID, she brought a, a she came up with a bucket which could be used to wash carefully or do uh, stuff, uh, business carefully without spreading or, or yeah, facilitating the spread of the COVID. That's one element to look at. And the other element to look at, it has to be new. It has to be new in the field. Uh, so what she came up with as a solution, is it new or there was, it could be 
it was just a discovery. Was it invented? Was oh, it was just a discovery? That's very very important, and that's uh, one of those are two of the main main elements. Now it is our authorities, either national or international national but regional that can decide really examine these uh, different uh, inventions I, I say inventions here in quotes and to see whether they they match with those elements they are kind of checkpoints they, there's a checklist uh what is the other one? the trade secret is easy it has to be that this is a secret that is being kept and it is being used in trade because of that secret it's, it's facilitating facilitating trade and there has to be proof that actually that trade secret secret is being used in trade that's a very very important element it's not just to say oh that's my secret is it important for the trade or for whatever business you are doing so when you talk about smes or whichever business is it important uh what is the other one uh geographical indications which i mentioned also the main elements yeah is it coming are there special characters qualities that can only be explained because of the attachment to that geographical situation uh, uh, place i mentioned the white paper of penja i i i really hope some of you have tasted it it's very nice it has a very nice uh, smell but it because of the special circumstances uh, climate so it's again the authorities in uganda for example we have the uganda registration services bureau you have the kenya industry property institute in kenya you have different bodies on a regional level we have the aripo uh, african regional intellectual property organization you have also owapi organization african dollar property intellectual or african organization for intellectual property you have the international level you have the registration at the wipo which is it gives you protection in so many countries though as i, I mentioned for very, for practical reasons it's good to start small to start with the national or regional wherever the protection is the other thing i didn't yeah the industrial designs is again you have to go through the checklist is there a ornamental value on 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 the project on the object that is sought to be protected and is it uh, new is it, is it uh, having value there are different again checklists and also the terms of protection are different for example patent the term of protection traditional is 20 years from the time the patent is is grant is filed though there are different uh practices now you can even have as much as 70 there are countries that are protecting for 70 years the the same with the copyrights you have a uh, term of protection is the life of the author so if i live uh, 100 years so that part is protected plus 50 years after my death so that's 150 years there are again uh, different variations of practices but the law international law and regional and national law those are the basic rules so it all depends on the country but that's just to give an, an overview and just to say that it's always good to inform oneself about the standards what is a standard in a particular region location for example you uh, the general rule about copyright is that you don't have even to register it you don't have to register for it to be protected protected it comes automatically but then the practice is going in the direction of requiring registration for the simple reason or one of the reasons that are being advanced and it makes sense that if you have to protect that to have like a legal case or a contention for that copyright so you need some kind of proof to say that hey i'm the one who created this i came up with this book or I this um, painting or carving on such and such a day and it belongs to me 
which is not really the case when you just assume that the moment it's done, then it's protected because that's the law, the general law. So not long ago, Uganda actually launched this, uh, uh, an instrument uh, about registration, really making registration. Uh, diploma may be diplomatically compulsory, but it's good for the owner of the copyright. And there are so many jurisdictions. I know that USA is the same. I'm sure there are so many on the African continent. But that's just food. It's optional for some and it's food for thought. Is but it's important really to be able to prove ownership. Yeah. Thank you, Susan. Also for the overview that you've given us, not just of intellectual property but you know touching on what's happening in the continent or on the continent and also the areas of focus entities other than government we're going to move into intellectual property and small businesses earlier on you said something very powerful you know you were giving us guidelines as mm -hmm. to how we can tell whether our products or our services or our creations can or should be protected or patented. What is the situation right now based on your observation of the continent and outside in the diaspora? What issues do small businesses face when it comes to protecting their intellectual property? Uh, first of all, I think we need to take a step back and look at the continent as a whole and the contribution of the SMEs or MSMEs, meaning also micro, the first M. It's, a, it's huge, it's enormous. Research shows, statistics, sorry, shows that uh, SMEs contribute around 70 to eight to 90 percent, depending on the country, of, 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 the, of the production sphere to the uh, production and contribution to trade. Most of the trade is in SMEs, so to say. Uh, I was just uh, a bit having my eyebrows up. I was discovering that in Mozambique, for example, you have 97.8% uh, SMEs. The economy survives on that. So it's a very important area. And how would it connect to intellectual property? First of all, there, the main question I think will be, how do those SMEs increase their visibility and then income and returns? And I think, not I think, I'm convinced that intellectual property is one tool. It's one tool that can help SMEs, can help any business to increase its returns to get its cap or oh, yeah returns let's keep it at that as a terminology so what are the challenges first of it starts with uh you have smes most of them or most of the trade we have on the continent is in the informal sphere is in the informal yeah as as opposed to formal we don't have like structured offices or structured deals, but there is trade, life goes on. And there are those small ones like, Christian, you've mentioned, things like bakeries, things like deliv delivery services, but they may not be sophisticated. They're not huge trucks, but people still deliver. We know, and then we know that that's a delivery service. That's a cleaning company. That's a baking company. That's a company that provides uh, maybe a few textiles. I, I talk about Arabica coffee. It's a very common service on the continent. At this way I come from, and just yesterday, I, had, I saw someone proudly holding a pack of Arabica coffee, which was brought to her by someone from Kenya. And when I read the pack, it was it has the logo of the the company, and it's saying that uh, it they have branches in Kenya, Uganda, and Rwanda. That's already a, a big region covered, but. When I looked at again and I, I, I took a photo, I asked Sky if I could really take a photo of this pack. There is no protection of anything apart from the business name. Even that, I'm not sure. 
you see. But because one, it might be the perception that this small enterprise, they perceive, okay, it's not necessary. Or they are not even aware, we spoke about you know, uh, intellectual property, that they have to protect. And as soon as, oh, um, this is my area of expertise, intellectual property. So I would like to take these uh, details and I get more information as what they've done with it, or it's just going out there. We have a, a, a logo and that's it. And many small businesses in, in on the continent and, and elsewhere, they they think, okay, think yeah, I'm personalizing the business that like just having the name is enough. You see, but there's a difference between having a business name and having your intellectual property. Protecting a business name and protecting the intellectual property of the business is not the same. And that's a different income stream, which uh, we may not be able to get into, but when you can get money from just the intellectual property, businesses here yeah, mean well. It's not, it's not just the product you give out, the product you sell, but the fact that you have that logo, you can protect. That was very interesting, you know, just breaking down what it means to protect even your image, like a logo. Do you have a lot of, let's go to, okay, we, we can keep in the field of logo, but it also extends to copyrights and to, yeah, this business. You have so many universities, okay, universities, they call themselves. You have, for example, Harvard University in Uganda, or oh, international universities. You have, <laughs> I, the other day I saw Stanford. Passing mm -hmm. off is the, the word that is commonly used, at least in common law countries, when you're learning intellectual property or trademark, the book of passing off. But then it could be, yeah, it's a misuse. You see, holding out or writing on the back of other companies without actually being the, the one or holding the same key. And when we look at practical examples or successful ex uh, case studies or stories, uh, bring out how women, really for women entrepreneurs, this could be really important to have an idea, I call it identity or a name give a name and to identify you better. You know, um, even using people's pictures without permission yeah. on billboards, you know, taking international companies and copying their names and things like that. Mm -hmm. And again, I think it speaks to, first of all, us not regulating <laughs> this yeah. area very well, but mm -hmm. also the, the desperate need to survive. Like nobody is paying attention to certain things. You're just trying to survive, right? Yeah. So Susan, I know that you're also very passionate about women and intellectual property. Can you delve into that for us, please? Oh, thank you. Yes, I'm passionate because, first of all, because we've spoken about SMEs and I may added M, the micro businesses. A lot of our economies are surviving on the backs of women, of the work of women, but it's not valued either by the users or the owners themselves, the women, as work that is beyond just making the family survive and the children live on. No, there's that kind of, when there's a cultural kind of perception, towards the work of the late women, but there is also the ignorance of, of what it can bring. And why I think this is a very important area to really develop or think about and aspire to develop is because actually it contributes a lot to the, to the economy, to our economies in Africa. I was just re reading the World Bank statistics. They're saying that the small and medium enterprises I already mentioned, they, they, they contribute around 70-80% and about 60 of the, that is a contribution by women. So you see how much they are sustaining the economy, how much they are contributing to the GDP. So uh, I'm saying that 
looking into intellectual property, how it can help them, and even other spheres, electronic commerce, how they can use it, is to help the whole continent. And for me, this becomes even more important when we are talking about the continental free trade agreement or area. We are aspiring to have uh, seamless borders. There are so many women who are who are crossing these borders, actually they contribute 70% of the cross-border trade in Africa is, is composed of women. So it's important to focus on this sector, to focus on these people. And it also becomes important for me, at least I was thinking of the Agenda 2063. It's talking of the Africa we want. And one of the things that I mentioned there is the to to sustain women, to help the women, but it's really not defined how. And there, here you go, you have the African Continent of Future Agreement. It is a byproduct, it's a project of that Agenda 2023. Now I'm saying, if we are going to develop this area, if we really want to be secure, we need to bring the women on now and start to look at what they can produce now and how it, they can be helped produce now and not in 2063. <laughs> this is still a long way to go. Uh, so it was, it was that background. And how does intellectual property help? It comes back to, first of all, look at the women and what they're being as a business. It's not just to bake so they can get a little money and sustain the home or to make beautiful mats, uh, baskets, or just so that they can get uh, again a little money and be sustaining additional income to sustain the home. But to look at it like that's a source of income that can be protected and the business has the potential to grow and we look into that potential and it's how do we get there i'm looking at or thinking about um african women in particular and how yes. community is very very important mm. and you find women in business are often and, and entrepreneurship, let me just say, even, you know, small businesses, farming, whatever it is, mm. a lot of them have friends, sisters, cousins, relatives, you know, who are in these businesses already. Mm. And you get into business, you're supported by the community, you know, you sell in your community, you mentor in your community, you know, yes. someone has an idea, you pick up the idea, you try to expand it where you are. So I'm just trying to think how... Um, intellectual property can be protected in our female communities when we really feed off one another. You mentioned several things there. You talk, spoke of having an idea and passing on the idea. So we are talking of the traditional knowledge, which I, I described at the beginning, what kind of intellectual property exists. And then we are talking of community. Is there, do we see, so if I may rephrase your question, people have belonged to a community, do we see any help in intellectual property? Yes, I'm going to show you with uh, an example, success story, something actually I wanted to really use as a demonstration. So that we, we see that we are talking about real stuff here, you see, something that is possible. Uh, I don't know whether you've heard of the Taita baskets. It's a, uh, it's uh, tighter baskets, they are baskets, as, as you hear them. And we agree that many women on our continent, they weave baskets. It can be from banana fibers, it can be from sisal. When I was growing up in, in primary school, we did a lot of work, hand, they called it handcrafts, with baskets from sisal, from banana uh, fibers, from uh, different material, but which we got and i have to emphasize we got from the bushes we didn't have to buy them they didn't have to be special but there was the traditional knowledge which was passed on they taught us how do you get the size from that green thing how do you get off the green stuff until you get the thread that's very important before you even make the basket or make the rope 
You have to, to know that. Then uh, we used to make things like mats. Uh, you go looking around for palms and sometimes we dye them. We would dye them using leaves, leaves from the, the, the bushes. We didn't have to buy dye. And then we'd make different patterns on which would be examined. But the poor have gone ahead. They're swimming poor and making mats, beautiful rugs, and they dye using those, they're called natural dyes from plants. They, they're not bought. And so how did people know there was someone who passed on that knowledge and it has been improved by skills? But let's come back to Taita Basket. They have the traditional knowledge, but in itself, it could maybe trust could come and just, okay, I want this basket, it's good, or maybe business people, and they just go off and take. But then this community, they said, no, we would like to identify ourselves. And the target, of course, was to get some more money. So with the help of the World Intellectual Property Organization, WIPO, the Taita late women, they're from uh, northeast of Mombasa in Kenya. So in that region, so this Taita Taveta region or county, it's a, it's a county. So this is a community. They live somewhere. Christine, I'm trying to, to demonstrate to you how people in a community can actually have intellectual property. So they first made an association of the Taveta, the Taita Taveta Women Basket Association. And this association, now it has a name. And that name, they and the designs, they got a logo, a kind of big a logo. Let's call it a logo, but a design that identifies them, and that is protected as a collective mark. It's a type of trademark. You can have collective marks. You can have certification marks. They all have different rules and implications, but. They protect it with a collective mark. So it's protecting the collection of these different women. But each of them, they have their little stores, little groupings. But, but then there has to be a certain standards. And then they there's something that is identified as, hey, you see this basket? It has It's bearing the, the name Taita. You know that it comes from this region, north northeast of Mombasa. And... Apart from that, there is a quality that goes with it. So I hope you see what I'm talking about. The intellectual property there is the collective mark. It's a type of trademark. I really love that. And I wonder how many people are aware of this, Susan. Thank you for breaking it down. The collective mark is extremely important because mm -hmm. the biggest issue we have is a lack of knowledge. Yeah. And it's so painful that large companies, you know, from within and outside the continent can come and zone in on what a group of people is doing and mm -hmm. just patent that. And you start supplying this large company with your original intellectual content, your yeah. service, your product, and they own it. So I think yeah. that's, that's really, really important. Um, are there any other success stories or challenges that you can share? Yeah, one time, they are not just success stories, but I've been actually addressing this and encouraging. I, I was speaking, once I went to, by then it was called Swaziland, now Iswatini, the, the country, Iswatini. But interestingly, there is a company, they call themselves Iswatini. They produce very beautiful embroidery, beads. I mention this because I know that many women on our continent, they work with beads. They, they produce a lot. And all I'm saying is that it's not useless. It's, it's not a loss. We can make money out of it. So I was telling them, you need to put a, a tag Identify yourself. Call yourself. You already call yourself Eswatini. So protect this Eswatini and then work on every product that comes, your bid work. So that's protected. And then, by the way, that bid work matches is pro can be protected by co intellectual property. I mean, by copyright, the bids. You can protect the collective, the different people who work there by trademarks, as I told you, collective marks. But you can also 
protect the designs, how they design those different maps with design. I, it's, some, it's a type of intellectual property which I didn't bring up. So you can see that you can have one product and it's protected by different things. It's like to have the drink. Inside there's a drink in a beautiful bottle. You have the, the industrial design protecting the, the bottle, but then there is the protection on the drink itself. You see, like, like I mentioned in the case of Coca-Cola. So there are many things. And small businesses, I stress here, or micro business, because most women business are really micro. They can still use this kind of tools. The other success story I wanted to, I can bring up again from Africa. There are so many all outside Africa, but I'm dwelling on Africa because we're talking about Africa today. Uh, in Ethiopia, you have something they call Sorebo. It's, it's, it's a company now. But, but what do they do? They produce shoes and all things in that range, slippers, flip-flops, as some people call them, uh, gulliwellas, as some people would have called it, but this is refined. It's very comfortable. It's, it's uh, soft and it's durable, but they, they are different types. They produce out of sisal, which I already mentioned before, it's a plant. They also produce out of uh, cow skin or animal skins. And the one I, I, that really touched me was the innovativeness of this group. They call one brand, I mean, Soul Rebels, and then another brand, I forget the name, which is specifically targeted at the vegetarians, meaning they are not using the cow. And the bottom thing is that they get rubber. They also are rubber. That, that's actually the main innovative bit. We use the rubber, recycle the material, so they are brought to life by producing new items like shoes, like bags. I know that in Uganda, they, there are also many of such productions. And I, I want to mention here, G-Swim is, is an organization that works with women. G-Swim is a shortcut for grooming successful women with an intellectual mind. And they work on how to add to goods and how to get intellectual property on the different goods. We are working with them and working on, um, we are collaborating with them. So I, I thought I should mention that, you know, that even in low development, developing countries, least developed countries like Uganda, you have people thinking in this. But back to the Ethiopian situation. So how has this uh, evolved? This uh, soul rebel and you see that playing with words there already is that they were they used to be and they are still rebels in Ethiopia. So it attracts the mind when they talk of so rebel, you're like, okay, which gives the, also the, the point that we have to be cautious the name we give and what kind of message it, it, it uh, communicates. It does not have to be stolen or copied like pick pay or picnic pay. You can come up with a name that reflects the environment and what is happening, like so rebels. So they have these different items. And how have they used intellectual property? It's a long story. They've done so many things, amazing. One, of course, they worked at the quality. You need to go do the branding. Branding is a develop, how do people identify you? Not uh, yourself, how do you identify yourself? But how do people identify you when they read Saw Rebels? When they read Secure the Back Africa? What goes in the people's mind? Do they identify it with quality, delivery, on time? The kind, you know, that kind of image you one builds. So they built that online and also not only nationally, but internationally. And of course, the quality of their products. But in terms of intellectual property, they've gone ahead besides protecting the Ethiopian industrial property uh, institution. They've also protected with the US PTO, US Patent and Trademarks Office, and the EU office. So they've gone international. So they have the market outside. But then is it helping? Yes, the sales have gone up. 
because of that protection, but also because they are international. Then they are employing so many people. So the whole economy is benefiting. This was a lady from one lady, Miss Alem. She had a vision. She started small, but she kept at it. But she just didn't say, okay, I'm a small, I'm a woman. I just, she protected. They went ahead. It's become a big family business. It's a community business and has a country benefits. That's another success story. Thank you so much, Susan. That is quite inspiring. Um, before we move on to our conclusions, I'd like to know, is there anything else in particular that you feel that, you know, you, people really need to know, especially about um, everything you've mentioned, whether it's women, whether it's SMEs, government policies. Yes. Uh, first of all, let me mention that there are challenges, of course, to getting intellectual property. I mean, to using intellectual property for business. One, it's not a magic wand. It's not like just because you have it that your uh, goods are going to sell. I've just given the example of the solar rebels. They had to do marketing. That's very, very important. So you, you, you still have to market the product. Then you have to do that. Let's start from the base. Generate the intellectual property so that uh, the product must have some kind of quality. And that's who, what organizations like G Swim are doing is not just entrepreneur, but tell people how do you make a bag from rubber attractive and marketable? Or how do you make ear pins from papers bring you more money? This kind of thing. They, they sound so basic, ear pins from papers, you see, but the, you can get money from them. So there is some market work that has to be done on marketing, but also on quality control. Then, of course, just to get the original, I, I, I mentioned when we were talking about intellectual property and properties, and I mean, what are the properties and requirements? There has to be registration. Most of it requires registration. It costs money. So that has it's been a challenge. But then what I challenge people is it has to be part of the business plan you have to think of an intellectual property strategy. And if you think of a strategy, owning one is one of them, the strategies, and how you are going to defend it, how you are going to commercialize it. To commercialize, I mean, how do you sell it? You can sell it, you can rent it, you can franchise it. I, to the, for example, this uh, so Rebel, they are negotiating franchise, franchising their product meaning that they, they are going to get money now out of just the intellectual property, not the shoes, not the bags, not the slippers. So that's, those are some of the challenges, but I encourage people to think, to have a long-term vision. I accept that it's hard, but have a long-term vision to start small and just starting in, in a, a group, like I mentioned, the Taita Basket Collective group of people, it can be helpful that the, the original burden is not borne by just one, one company or one person or enterprise. It can apply to mat, sports, whatever we, we have, or even product, other products. Uh, concerning regulations, uh, I think every country, to the best of my knowledge, has some kind of regulations. Whether they are respected is another thing. <laughs> so I would encourage the different women to find out what they have on the ground and what, what they need to, to get out of it to apply to their inventions, creativities. Yeah, the, the, that's what I could say. But the regulations exist in most countries, to the best of my knowledge. Thank you so much, Susan. In conclusion, I would like to ask you, Mm -hmm. What are your three tips that you would give to an individual in Africa to preserve their intellectual property or to take steps to do so? Thank you. Three tips. First, have an intellectual property strategy. Just 
wake up and tell yourself, whatever I'm doing has value and it can be protected. That's very important. Then work out to that, strat to that strategy. How do we get the protection? It will mean you need to understand what is required and of course work on the, the value, quality, sorry, and then uh, go, go for it. Try it out at least, just like you try out selling stuff. Instead of just convincing myself, I just try and just do whatever ABCD is doing. Fine, do that, but with a touch, with quality, with identity. IP, intellectual property, identifies you. Second, for the women, I think you need to know that they are the backbone of the, our economies, developing economies. In, when you talk of SME, if you have more than 50 or 60% that are contributing, that's a lot for, for an economy that is, uh, for economies that are contributing only 20% to GDP. So having that in mind, I'm talking about the mindset, I'm addressing the mindset here. Then I would encourage each woman, to walk tall, telling oneself the country depends on me. That comes with two things. Feeling good that you, can, you are the one sustaining, but also giving a certain kind of responsibility, which we have to work on. Feeling that you're responsible for the economy, it too should push at us on. The third tip I'll give, don't work in silos. Either work, I mentioned the title basket as an example to bring up intellectual property, but intellectual property is more than, is well beyond just owning it or having it. There are so many other skills we need. There's a lot of other information and other people might have it. So work in collaboration, work in partnership with people who are trusted. Wow, this has been very informative. Um, it's so easy to leave gaps. It's so easy to take for granted what you see around yeah. you and believe that that's, that's all there is and that's your position and you're visible. Yeah. So I'd like to thank you so much and commend you for the work that you're doing for the continent all the way from Geneva. And it's my hope that more people will be impacted by all of the content that you've shared with us. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Secure the Bag Africa. It is my hope that, yes, just like you, that people will be impacted, but they also take on and run with a torch. <laughs> Thank you for joining us on the Purpose and Vision Mastery Podcast. Remember, purpose transforms everything.